This episode is sponsored by Celestron, manufacturer of high-quality telescopes and an industry leader in developing exciting optical products with revolutionary technologies. I'm Kelly Beatty of Sky and Telescope magazine, and tonight we're going on a tour of the stars and planets that you'll see overhead during March. This month, we'll mark two seasonal transitions, watch a spectacular pairing of Venus and Jupiter, spend some time with Orion, and learn what Sirius has to do with hot summers. So grab your curiosity and come along on this month's Sky Tour. This will be a month of transition in more ways than one. First, on March 12th, we jump to daylight time in virtually all of the U.S. and Canada. In fact, this month clocks will spring forward in much of the Northern Hemisphere, but the date for all that time shifting varies. It comes two weeks later, the 26th, across Europe, and three weeks later in parts of Mexico, except places like Tijuana that are near the U.S. border. And because autumn is approaching for our friends down under in Australia, they'll switch back to standard time on April 2nd. If all this sounds confusing, well, it is. And even though you've probably heard that Benjamin Franklin was the first to propose a seasonal switch to daylight time, that honor actually belongs to Englishman William Willett. He was an avid golfer who wanted to spend more time after work working on his putting. So in 1907, Willett published a pamphlet titled The Waste of Daylight, in which he proposed advancing the clock during summer months. For us sky watchers, daylight time can be a bit of a nuisance because it means the sky doesn't get dark until well into the evening hours, especially in midsummer. For more on this whole subject, search for my Bah Humbug blog on skyandtelescope.org. March is also when Earth reaches one of the two equinox points in its year-long orbit. This month it falls on the 20th at 5.24 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. You've likely heard that this equinox also signals the beginning of northern spring, astronomically speaking, and the start of autumn south of the equator. But there's more to it than just that. Equinox comes from the Latin word equinoctium, meaning equal nights. On this date, days and nights everywhere are both 12 hours long. And if you're directionally challenged, on the equinox, the sun rises due east and sets due west, no matter where you are. The switch to daylight time has one advantage for sky watchers. During March, for most of us, the sky is once again dark when we get up each day. So try not to stumble when you step outside before dawn. Honestly, for the past several months, we've been totally spoiled by all the planets in view as evening sets in. First came Saturn and Jupiter, then they were joined by Mars, then Saturn sank out of view, and soon Jupiter will be gone as well. Mars is still hanging around and easily in view, and I'll get to the red planet in a bit, but the real showpiece these March evenings is Venus. This month starts off with a celestial bang, because on March 1st, Venus and Jupiter will pair together just a half a degree apart. That's the diameter of a full moon. In the days thereafter, Jupiter will slowly slide lower down, so enjoy it while you can. Meanwhile, Venus will gradually rise higher in the west at dusk each evening, and it will continue to do so until late May, when it will make an about-face and slowly dive toward the western horizon until it fades from view in late July. But right now, it's very bright and obvious. How soon after sunset can you spot Venus? 30 minutes afterward should be a slam dunk, but 15 to 20 minutes will be a good test of your vision. In fact, if you know exactly where and how to look, it's possible to spot Venus in the middle of the day, in broad daylight. Veteran sky watcher Bob King tells you how in the March issue of Sky and Telescope. Venus has an interesting pattern of visibility. Showing up in the evening after sunset and then in the east before dawn, you'll sometimes come across references to Venus as the morning star and the evening star, even though, of course, it's not a star at all. Moreover, this back-and-forth movement of Venus in the sky repeats almost exactly every eight years. If you were to look west after sunset at, say, 8 p.m., and then mark your calendar for that same date in March 2031, you'll find Venus in almost exactly the same spot. Why so? 
Well, Venus circles the sun in just under 225 days, about seven and a half months. And it just so happens that the time it needs to orbit the sun 13 times is a very close match to the time Earth takes to go around the sun eight times. This 13 to 8 ratio is so perfect that the difference is only about three and a half minutes from one cycle to the next. Many cultures have realized that Venus makes a repeat appearance every eight years, but none of them studied it more closely than the ancient Maya of southern Mexico and Central America. They created tables that marked Venus's position throughout the year, inscribed these observations on their monuments, and even built some temples with alignments that mark where Venus appears farthest north and south along the horizon throughout the year. According to archaeoastronomer Anthony Avani, Maya priests saw significance in this astronomical coincidence. For them, he explains, everything had to be understood in terms of whole number multiples, and that's where Venus and its eight-year rhythm with the sun comes in. Of course, the evening sky offers much more to see than just Venus. The full worm moon falls on March 7th, so the last half of March will feature moon-free evening skies. Once it gets dark, make a quarter turn to your left from where the sun set and just look up. Wow! All of the brilliant stars of winter are arrayed before us in all their glory. Probably easiest to spot is Orion the hunter. Look high in the south for a distinctive row of three stars in a roughly horizontal line that mark the hunter's belt. For me, the belt is something of a signpost on the celestial highway. All three of those stars have names. On the left is Al-Nitak, which means the girdle in Arabic. In the middle is Al-Nilam, which translates as string of pearls. And on the right is Mintaka, which means the belt. They're all very close to the celestial equator. That is, if you took Earth's equator and expanded it out into space, it would pass right through Mintaka. To the belt's lower right is the star Rigel, which marks his foot. To the belt's upper left, at Orion's shoulder, is the bright star Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse if you prefer. It's often stated that this is an Arabic phrase meaning the armpit of Orion, but a more careful translation of the original Arabic probably refers to his hand. Anyway, do you remember that a few years ago Betelgeuse was mysteriously much dimmer than normal? It's returned to full brightness now. Apparently, the dimming was caused by an immense mass of hot material that the star ejected into space, which then cooled to form a dust cloud that blocks some of the light coming from the star's surface. Let's use Orion to make some other easy identifications. Directly above Orion's shoulders, by about twice the width of your clenched fist held at arm's length, is the planet Mars. Follow a line through the belt stars toward Orion's upper right, also about two fists away, and you'll run into the bright star Aldebaran and the constellation Taurus the Bull. Beyond Aldebaran, in that same direction, is a compact little cluster called the Pleiades. Meanwhile, to the hunter's upper left are the stars of Gemini, with the twin stars Pollux and slightly dimmer Castor. Higher still, above Mars and almost overhead, is the bright star Capella. Now, look to Orion's immediate left, and you'll see Procyon, the alpha star of the constellation Canis Minor, the little dog. There's not much to Canis Minor, actually. It's one of the smaller constellations to begin with, and Procyon and the dimmer star to its immediate upper right are pretty much the whole show. To me, the constellation looks more like a hot dog than a four-footed hunting companion. To Procyon's lower right, by not quite three fists, is brilliant Sirius, the dog star, Sirius and Procyon are practically next-door neighbors, cosmically speaking. Respectively, they're only 9 and 11 light-years away. Sirius is the brightest star in the entire sky, aside from our own sun, of course. Keep an eye on the horizon directly below Sirius. It's located due south at 8 p.m. on March 1st, and, thanks to the shift of summertime, it'll also be due south at 8 p.m. on March 15th. Now go back to Betelgeuse for a moment. Imagine that it's at the center of a huge six-sided hexagon in the sky. At the very top is Capella. Going around clockwise, you'll find Aldebaran, then Rigel, then Sirius at the bottom. Upper left from there are Procyon, the twins of Gemini, and finally back to Capella. Congratulations! You have just traced out what sky watchers know as the winter hexagon, 
All of these stars are bright enough to show up even if you have a lot of light pollution where you live. Sirius is the real star of the winter season, but you can see it throughout much of the year if you know when to look. Sometime in August, it first becomes visible low in the east shortly before dawn. 5,000 years ago, because of the wobble in Earth's spin axis, this first pre-dawn appearance occurred in late June, and ancient Egyptians knew that first glimpse of Sirius came just before the annual flooding of the Nile River. They worshipped the star as the spirit of the river, and apparently they were also the first to depict this star as a dog. In more recent times, sky watchers realized that the dog star rises and sets with the sun during late July, an arrangement in the sky known as a conjunction. Some cultures believed that when this pairing occurred, the heat from Sirius combined with the heat of the sun, creating the hot and sultry weather that often comes in late summer. So they named this period of time, from 20 days before the conjunction to 20 days afterward, the dog days. And today, we still refer to this sticky weather as the dog days of summer. Thanks for letting me show you around the stars and planets for another month. If you want more tips for viewing the night sky, including a free interactive star chart for any time or date, check out our website, skyandtelescope.org. If you haven't already subscribed, you can find this sky tour on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating or a review. It'll help spread the word about Sky Tour, and I really welcome your feedback. And if you want to explore the solar system and universe more deeply, check out the full line of binoculars and telescopes available at Celestron.com. Sky Tour is a production of Sky and Telescope, a division of the American Astronomical Society, and is produced by me, Kelly Beatty. Next month, I'll talk about some carnivores that are stalking upward in the eastern sky. Until then, I wish you clear skies. <laughs>